when we drill ice cores we try to get level spots where the ice is undeformed and not ridged that's mostly those areas where we want to know how the ice grew what its growth history is the properties the profile of these properties from the top to the bottom and today on a day like this where melt is in full swing and in fact today is a really uh, day with with a lot of sunshine the surface is melting very very rapidly and has been over the past few days um, you can see that pretty much all the level spots on the ice uh, if you look out here all those spots where the ice is level and undeformed are covered by meltwater there's uh, probably about 80 percent or 90 percent of the surface of the ice today are covered by this water in a lot of spots, like just out here, if you follow the snow machine track, you can see that even those areas where the snow cover is still deep, at the base of the snow, there is plenty of meltwater. Uh, and only in the highest spots, uh, where, where the snow machine went over a little ridge there, say, or further back, do you actually have really dry ice. But today, I would estimate in that area where we are here, where there's little deformed ice that juts out above the water, we might only find, you know, five or 10% dry spots. So it's extremely wet today. Quite interesting to be out here. Of course, you need your rubber boots. Um, so what we wanna do is drill another surface core here so we can get a better idea of why the water isn't draining. You know, normally you'd think that this water, it's sitting actually on top of the ice, like a perched lake, you know, almost as if there's a lake on top of the ice cover um, but if you get a hole in here uh, the water drains very rapidly so any seal breathing hole or any hole that we create the water normally would drain down and so we'll just drill here and see what we get so again this is the uh, you know, the old-fashioned way of getting ice samples, but the nice thing about it is it, it's much more quiet <laughs> than uh, using even the electric drill and a generator. Um, also, a lot of times you might want to use just a two-stroke gas-powered engine, and those, of course, are extremely loud, extremely fickle, difficult to use, in particular when it gets very, very cold. So on some occasions, you know, if you're out in remote places where you don't want to lug along a generator or electric drill and all the accessories, we might just take the pourer and, and just do everything by hand. Um, takes a bit more patience, but uh, works just as well. And of course, one nice thing is if you drill by hand like this, you have a much better feel for, you know, what the properties or, or at least the strength and integrity of the ice is like because you feel every little bit of resistance or every little layer in there and so this is actually quite you know it's almost like you're feeling your way into the ice so it tells you a bit more than you would be able to learn from just using the electric drill and just powering through I think that's gonna do it. Let's see whether we can snag this. Uh, not today, so we'll have to break this loose in the hole. Get this out of the way. Oh, here's the top part. Oh yeah, and this is really nice because you can see so this top part was floating in the hole that I just drilled here. And the bottom part is attached to the ice still. So I actually have to jam this off and reach in here and grab the bottom part. There we go. And as I'm doing this, I can already feel that there's several layers of ice down there. So here's the bottom part of the core that we just drilled. And basically what you have here is that this top part, it's like a layer that's sitting on top of the ice where I can, if I take my hand now, I can reach in here and I can actually grab underneath that layer. My fingers actually vanish between the top layer 
Of course, the water is cold between the top layer and this bottom layer here. And this top layer is refrozen melt water that uh, during the early stages of melt, when you know you can see this here, this is snow, the snow is starting to melt. The melt water seeps down into the snow and starts building up at the base, just like you see here. You know, so there's you know, even though this is snow at the bottom, it's saturated with melt water. And that melt water, the snow melts at zero degrees centigrade, 32 Fahrenheit. When that melt water trickles down through the snow, it hits the cold sea ice, the ice temperature because sea ice contains salt, it can be much colder, minus one, minus two centigrade, you know, 28 uh, Fahrenheit or even lower. And so the snow melt water trickles down and it almost instantly refreezes and it forms this layer here. And that layer spreads out over large, large areas everywhere where the snow melts. And um, it, it's almost like a seal. It's like putting a black top tar surface on here, um, just like a parking lot. This type of ice is, is impervious to water, so it retains the water on the surface very, very well. And as a result, we find that large areas of this ice now are almost entirely covered by meltwater, just like on a big, big parking lot after a rainfall, the water just doesn't run off unless you create artificial drainage holes or gullies. Um, and it's the same thing here. Um, so if, if this type of superimposed ice forms, it retains the surface melt water and it's going to take quite a while, probably, uh, you know, maybe another week or so, or at least a few days for the water to, or, or the ice to slowly get more permeable. Eventually a lot of this will drain again so that, you know, maybe a week from now or so, we'll only have half of the surface covered by melt ponds. There you have it.